so I could probably spend hours just talking about all the ways I've effed stuff up. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to impact the world and still turn a profit? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Growth Everywhere. This is the show where you'll find real conversations with real entrepreneurs. They'll share everything from their biggest struggle to the exact strategies they use on a daily basis. So if you're ready for a value-packed interview, listen on. Here's your host, Eric Sue. Hey everyone, just a quick heads up that we're giving away a ebook called 29 Growth Hacking Quick Wins. We co-authored this book with Matan Griffel of One Month and it'll give you a solid base on where you can create growth ideas from. So all you need to do is text QUICK TIPS to 33444. That's the word QUICK, Q-U-I-C-K and TIPS, T-I-P, S as in sugar to 33444 and you get instant access. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Growth Everywhere, where we interview entrepreneurs and bring you business and personal growth tips. Today, we have Anand Sanwal, who is the CEO and co-founder of CB Insights, which helps you track the world's most promising private companies, their investors, and their acquirers to help you sell more, innovate faster, and invest smarter. Anand, how are you doing today? I'm good, Eric. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show. So why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of who you are and, and what your background is? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of CB Insights. So we're a, a data company based in New York City. Um, kind of started the company, now it's been kind of six years ago, uh, after working in venture and M&A for a while. And kind of saw that the tools that we had to use in my old life weren't very good. Um, and always wanted to do my own thing. So myself and a few folks from American Express left and started building CB Insights to kind of build hopefully the, you know, the tools that we wish we had in our, in our past lives. Um, so that was kind of the genesis of this. You know, we are tracking private companies, which we, you know, are a vital and really massive part of the economy, but which have historically been incredibly opaque. Uh, and so we're trying to bring some visibility to those companies, to their investors, to their acquirers, and, and ultimately kind of help tell people what's next. So who's the next hot company? Who, what's the next big hot industry? You know, what's Google's next move going to be? Uh, so trying to use data to answer some of those hard questions. Got it. Okay, perfect. So how did you end up coming up with this company? Yeah, so I mean, it was, you know, it was kind of the sort of typical sort of founder story in some sense. You know, I was at Amex running a $50 million innovation fund at American Express, and we were using all these sort of old school incumbent tools. So, you know, Thompson, Dow Jones, folks like that, who um, were charging a fair amount of money for a pretty mediocre experience all the way around. The data wasn't very good. The UI, UX was sort of out of 1989. Um, and, you know, just thought, hey, we, there's a better mousetrap that can be built here. Uh, and then, you know, kind of thought also that technology could help us do that. So instead of having to call people up and say, hey, what deals did you do? Uh, could we build sort of machine learning software that would aggregate publicly available information and do it faster, more comprehensively, uh, you know, than sort of the old school methods? And, you know, sort of uh, saw myself at Amex reaching a point where I knew if I didn't leave, I'd just stay there because life was really comfortable. Uh, and decided, you know, I need to get out because I don't want to have a regret down the road of, of hey, I never tried my tried building my own thing. Got it. Okay. So, you know, just so the audience can get a little more context as to how yeah. CB Insights helps uh, helps the world in general. I mean, can, is there any case study that you can share? Yeah. So let me think of it. So, uh, yeah. So if there's, you know, if you're interested in venture capital, just as an example, right? There's a couple of ways to get that data, right? And so. Um, you can read 15 different newsletters and try to read TechCrunch and read VentureBeat every day, right? And try to aggregate all that information. Or what we do is we aggregate it all for you. So what you could say is, hey, I'm really interested in what's happening in mobile companies in Silicon Valley at the early stage. And you can essentially just build a feed and we'll just push all that deal data to you as and when it happens. So um, so what ends up happening is instead of spending 80% of your time gathering data and doing all this manual work, you basically kill all of that sort of manual low value effort, to be honest, and you can actually start doing interesting things with that information. So if you're in biz dev or you're an investor, 
you now have more time to research those companies and reach out to them and build relationships. Um, if you're in corporate strategy, instead of trying to you know, do all that data aggregation, now you're actually looking at what types of companies are being funded that might be problematic for our big sort of slow moving, you know, incumbent business. So that's kind of what people use us. That's at least one of the main use cases is just making this really opaque uh, market a lot more transparent. So d does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. And I love, you know, I, I love what you guys do in terms of content because it's really intuitive and it's laid out really well. So I guess, you know, what can you, what can you share around your, you know, quote unquote content marketing strategy? Yeah, so you know, content has been our sort of golden goose, without a doubt, right? And the re and it came to us not because I knew anything about content marketing, but just purely out of necessity. So in the beginning, you know, we're we're a revenue funded company, didn't raise any money. So how do we compete against you know these massive storied brands like Dow Jones and Thompson, who can take you to a Yankees game or who can take you to a nice dinner, right? We couldn't do any of that. So it was okay. Well, uh, you know, venture capital is a lot like. Uh, you know, political commentary. There's a lot of opinions, but there wasn't any data. So we said, well, what we do have that's unique and nobody's doing is we have a lot of data and we can provide some insights on that. And so we just sort of accidentally started doing these like research briefs that were just taking some topic people were talking about and trying to put some, some rigor behind it, some data behind it. Um, and we didn't do it, just to be very frank, we didn't do it very well in the beginning. Um, I think with content marketing, there's a few things that are really important. One, you know, it's got to be good. But two, I think you got to do it frequently. Uh, you know, I talked to other friends of mine or entrepreneurs who are like, oh, yeah, I want to do content marketing like CBI does. And the hardest thing is, like, you just got to stick to it, right? Like, you can't just do two awesome blog posts and just think, like, work's done. Right, so now like we're doing probably fifteen twenty a week, but in the beginning we weren't very consistent, so we'd get like these blips of success, and then we just wouldn't keep investing in it, and we finally realized like this is a magical channel for us, so we need to just keep doing more and more of it, um, and then now we've kind of like you know really growing that team out and and trying to you know do more of it and kind of innovate it in different ways as well. Awesome. So yeah, I think, you know, the way you guys organize your data and display it in a super, super intuitive way um, is, is great. But I think most, you know, content marketers don't understand how to, um, I guess, put a process like this together. So how does your team organize when it comes to content marketing? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a few things, right? Like there's, we do a couple of different types of briefs, right? So we'll do like deep industry type of briefs, right? And those are like just things maybe we're interested in and that we think the market will care about. Um, so, you know, what's happening in ed tech, right? So you kind of have your meteor, you know, longer form types of things. And then there's things that are just newsworthy, right? Like there's a peg in the news, like, you know, uh, Snapchat just got acquired, right? Back in the day, right? And so maybe there's something else about, well, what else is happening in mobile messaging, right? Right? So you want to try to find relevant things that people are talking about. And, um, you know, so we try to mix that up. And those might be shorter, kind of we call them internally sort of snackable posts. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing we're starting to experiment with a little bit more is, you know, we have this sort of kind of deep research oriented type of briefs. You know, should we do things that are a little bit more fun, that maybe are a little bit less, uh, you know, quantitative at times, but that are, interesting to our audience. So we did something just this week on the websites of 13 unicorn companies before they were a billion dollars, right? So it's not a big, it's not data driven at all, but it's relevant to our audience and they like that. And so like that post is doing really well and it's, you know, kind of, it's kind of different. So I think, you know, we're trying to mix it up a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is like we try to figure out what's what's trending, what's interesting in the market, and then try to figure out if our data can inform that in some some interesting way. Okay. What numbers can you share first around content marketing, and then what numbers can you share around the business today? Yeah. Uh, so content marketing, right? So, our, you know, I, one thing is I think our team growth there, right? So we are, um, it was just me and John, who's my co-founder in the beginning. That team is now, uh, it, on Monday it'll be five, folks, uh, one sort of person heading it up and four 
a analysts who do a lot of the, the heavy lifting on the commentary and then two data scientists. So it's the team's growing. I think I'd, you know, if I could have my way and find people, it'd be 15 tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's like, it is literally that important to us as a channel. Um, in terms of, you know, the metrics for us. So the, the other thing I think we do differently is we really don't care about page views. We don't care about number of tweets or anything. Like it's all about that content is all about getting people to trial our product. So the metric we care about is the number of trial signups we get as a result of the product. Um, and so, you know, we're probably getting, I don't know, close to a thousand trial signups a month just off of our content, right? That doesn't include our landing page or any other sort of sources of, of lead gen. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a big, and we're, you know, trying to grow that pretty aggressively. I think it's like 1.5% week over week is our goal to grow the number of signups. So it's a pretty, you know, we're trying to grow that pretty aggressively. So that's that's our metric, right? If something blows up and gets on Hacker News, it sort of gives us a, it's good ego boost. But we could really we don't care if none of those people sign up for CB Insights and aren't credible potential customers. Um, so that's kind of on the metric side that we kind of look at um, in terms of the business. You know, in 2013 we were sort of low seven figures revenue. 2014 we grew that by a little over 200 percent. Uh, 2015 is looking very good. I think we'll probably grow it again by another 125%. So we'll be in the high seven figures, you know, low eight figures range. Nice. Impressive. So the, okay, so content marketing is obviously driving a lot of th things. I mean, what else is driving acquisition for you guys right now? Yeah, so I think the other big thing we did initially was um, media outreach, right? And so, um, you know, media needs data. They need to inform, they need to provide context around their articles. And, um, you know, we weren't trying to be TechCrunch, right? We thought we could build a really sort of symbiotic relationship with the media. So we said, if they have a need for data, we want to be the go to place for them, right? And so I think like we are without a doubt that, like I think this year we've had 700 different articles reference CB Insights data already this year, right? Like this past week, I think it was The Economist, Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal. So uh, the thing we did early on was we would, one, we're super responsive to the media. Like they, we treat them as if we, you know, they're paying customers, they don't pay us anything. But um, so if they come and say, hey, listen, I'm looking for data on drones, like, you know, our team will go and figure out how to get them the data and let them know, you know, hey, here's the results. Um, but media outreach has been really big for us because what ends up happening is they, you know, will, they're writing an article about, let's say, a company that was just funded in the drone space. And in that, they'll say, you know, and according to CB Insights, you know, drone funding is up. 300% or whatever it is year over year and the link to something that we've written and then that link becomes another conduit by which folks find us um, and we spent a lot of time building out that media list so what we did in the beginning was it was pretty it's always been sort of ground and pound so we went to Google News we you know uh, search for all the terms that we thought were relevant to us so anybody covering venture capital for instance at a very simple level we tried to go find them right so anybody would written an article about venture capital we went and found them put them in a spreadsheet and then we went out to them and said hey we're releasing a report about trends in venture capital would you like to receive it and they you know a lot of them wrote back and said yeah sure we put out you know our data is good I think the big thing is like and I see other you know, players in the industry that do this, like their data, like journalists can't believe their data. With our data, like it's airtight. So we'd send them the data pre-release, they'd write up an article and we'd say, hey, listen, can you include a link to this page in your article that's going to eventually have, you know, all of our data about this topic. And so that sort of, that, you know, in the beginning was 20 journalists. Now our journalist list is probably approaching sort of 800. Um, Wow. And, you know, we go to them, we're very judicious about when we go to them, like we're not, we don't try to, you know, if we know you cover cybersecurity, we're not going to send you stuff about the on-demand economy. If we know you cover India, we're not going to cover, we're not sending you stuff about what's happening in Brazil. Um, and, you know, I think the product, the quality of what we put out is, 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 is you know, we keep, we have a pretty high bar. And so now we just get a lot of inbound from media because they see other, their media friends using us and, and it sort of has become a, like a really nice sort of uh, snowball effect in in some sense with our with our media contacts. Okay, so how many uh, people do you have on the let's just call them the, the outreach team? Because going from twenty to eight hundred is is impressive. 
Uh, oh, so the outreach team, I mean, we have one community manager right now. Um, and we have, yeah, really in terms of like who's managing the relationships, we have, uh, you know, one person doing that. And then, you know, a lot of it is the, the direct interaction between the analyst team and the media. So if somebody from CNBC wants to talk to us, you know, they'll either have my info or they have Matt or Mike's info on our analyst team. So we try not to have too many layers between them and us, right? We want to know exactly what they're after. Uh, and we tell them very quickly, like, hey, we don't have that data, right? Sometimes they have a need that's, you know, that's not related to something we have. We try to be very clear about what we're good at and what we're not and um, and just be responsive. But, yeah, there's not a big sort of infrastructure we have to, to manage that. Um, uh, it's it's pretty lean and you know they've built relationships with people on our team so some of them will come to me still but a lot of them will just go directly to to folks on our research team awesome okay so yeah it, it sounds really unique to me I mean you guys are using your content marketing to to in effect get more uh, get more reach and get more links coming back to you and it's working out really well because I think first of all your content stands out from the rest so um, that's great yeah, and I appreciate that. You know, I think and it's not; those aren't our only channels. So, like, you know, we were doing pay per click. We're doing Twitter. You know, we're trying a bunch. We're like we experiment a lot with channels. You know, we're LinkedIn, Facebook. I, you know, I'm of the view that we we're not going to do ten channels really well. Mm -hmm. So, what we try to do is find a channel that works, and then we try to, you know, internally our sort of phrase is we like try to bleed it dry. Right, so like we will just keep pounding that channel until we just feel like it's diminishing returns. So you know we've tried Pinterest, we've tried Flipboard, we've tried you know Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google PPC. You know we're doing webinars, we've done white papers, like we've tried a bunch of things, and then you know some things are all of them have maybe generated some results, but we're a small team, we can't do all of them. So then we look at the data and say, okay, these, this, this is where the best leads came from and this is where the most leads came from. Let's, let's do more of those. Makes sense. Okay, so let's switch gears for a little bit. You wrote a piece on 54 mistakes you made as a chief executive. So what are some big ones and what did you learn from them? I think, I mean, the biggest one, and I'm still learning from it, is around culture, right? So when I, I just all, I, to be very honest, I thought the whole corporate culture, business culture thing was kind of like just propaganda, right? I thought like it's something big companies do to like sort of brainwash you into feeling like you're doing something meaningful. Um, and what I realized was over time is, uh, you know, when we were 10 people, it was pretty easy. You know, it's it's me, Eric, and, and eight other guys, right? And, 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 and we're, everybody knows what's going on. We're in crappy offices. I'm writing the payroll, ch you know, I'm writing their checks for salary handwritten. Um, and everybody kind of knows, like, what the culture is. You know, when you get to 25 or 30 or 50 people, you know, people haven't seen the lean times, they haven't seen the terrible offices. So, you know, how do we sort of instill in them like the importance of customers and of being humble and all these things that we think are important? Um, I think that's been probably my biggest, you know, I, I sort of am really bought into the idea that like we need to, culture doesn't just happen, you have to actually build it. Um, so I think that's the one big thing. I think as we've gotten bigger too, like nailing process becomes important. So, you know, biz dev team, our biz dev team eight months ago was three of us. It's now 13, right? So, um, you know, not just assuming that people just will figure it out, like actually like having the scripts and having the templates and kind of nailing those things becomes important because Ultimately, it makes people more successful at their job if they don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Um, and then they can start thinking about higher order problems. They can start thinking about better ways of doing things versus inventing them for the first time again and again. Um, you know, so there's process, there's culture, um, you know, along with a lot of it all boils down to culture, right? So it's just communicating with the team. I think as we've gotten bigger, sort of over communicating becomes important. Um, not everybody knows what's going on, so kind of giving updates, kind of, you know, we do a monthly review at the beginning of every month showing revenue, you know, marketing, uh, you know, how many leads were generated, um, you know, kind of how content was doing. So every team sort of presents and pretty, you know, everybody knows how much money we're making all the time. So it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty kind of transparent in that sense. And I think that's been helpful for people to know what's going well, what's not going well. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I could go on and on. You saw you, you saw the post. There were fifty four screw ups. I could probably spend hours just talking about all the ways I've f stuff up. Uh, <laughs> but those are those are probably some of the big ones that I've learned, and I'm still still working on it. You know, it's my first company, real company. You know, so I have never built a company whether it's seven people, seventeen people, seventy people, or seven hundred. So it's just there's going to be new problems as we grow, but uh, hopefully we're staying you know a step ahead of them. Okay. So was there a specific event or like story that led you to realize, holy crap, you know, we need to work on culture slash onboarding. I mean, what was that story? Yeah. So I think there was like with onboarding, for instance, um, you know, like there was, you know, as we were getting bigger, I'd hear from other people on the team, like, hey, so-and-so is new and like they have no idea like what to do. Right. And they're like getting, they're sort of feeling demotivated and they're like just feeling like they're not doing a good job. And like it became pretty apparent that it wasn't their fault. It was sort of my fault or mine and John's fault for not giving them guidance. Right. And so, um, you know, I think there's this great thing that, uh, it's a great article on, on First Round Capital's website where they basically kind of say that, you know, when you're pit, when you're sort of selling somebody on taking a job, right, it's all like, roses and you try to present this really good picture to them and then when they come in you just sort of drop them in and you're like oh yeah like you know like you don't continue that sort of wooing um and i think like that became apparent because people were confused in their jobs they didn't know the goals they didn't know what was expected of them they didn't they didn't even know like who to have lunch with like in the, you know we sort of just dropped them in they were like here's your computer it wasn't even set up for you um you didn't know who to have lunch with day one so you were like maybe eating by yourself right like it was just a really being very frank it wasn't a very good experience and so like you don't want to come in your first day and then go home to your friends or your significant other whoever and be like yeah like i don't know if i got i don't know if i made the right decision so uh that was kind of pretty apparent so we've tried to like re-architect that with you know sort of I, one of the things we've actually done is we set up a mailchimp trip for our onboarding so you know, previously what would happen is you'd get like 50 emails day one, right? It'd be like, you got to sign up for Seamless for your lunch. You got to go fill out your payroll forms. It'd be 30 introductions from people on the team. And it was all very overwhelming. So we set up a MailChimp drip that like now you get emails over the first two weeks and they kind of like you ease into it. So you don't get 30 introductions from people. You know, you get two a day, you know, you get three a day, you get product tutorials, but you don't get seven on day one, you get like one every three days, so that way you learn the product slowly but surely. Um, there's checklists that say like, hey, have you done all these things? Did, you know, did have five people taking you to coffee? So, you know, I think we've like tried to to do better there um, and make that those first couple weeks a lot less stressful and a lot less sort of full of friction than they used to be. Got it. That's super smart. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So was there at any point in time where the company was on the brink of failure? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, we, we decided never to, ne not never, but at least to date, not to raise outside funding. So in the beginning, we were basically doing, before we were, we were pre-product, we were like doing anything and everything to make money. And one of those things was we were selling research totally unrelated to CB Insights to hedge funds about the credit card industry. And that was just because me and John and, and uh, the team were former Amex folks. So we were trying to sell this product and, you know, we were like, I, you know, John went to Columbia and I went to Wharton. So we were like, oh yeah, we have like this great network. Like this should be, you know, we just sort of naively thought this would be easy. We reached out to like everybody we knew. Nobody like wanted it. Um, and I was actually paying the team out of my savings because we didn't have any revenue coming in. And I guess it was like a year and a half in and like, you know, I'd just been married and like, you know, seeing the savings just like, go, just get killed like week to week. Um, and then uh, we were like, I think it was like February of six years ago, whatever that works out to. And, uh, you know, it was basically like, hey, we haven't sold any of this research product. We're not, CBI still has to be built. Like we're not anywhere. Um, and it was sort of a month away. And then totally kind of got lucky. The market 
like the general stock market kind of just kept going down at this point and credit cards became like a big deal um, and all these hedge fund guys started worrying about it and so, uh, this person reached out to us and said, hey, I think I can sell that research product of yours because I have all these relationships and we hooked up with his firm and uh, and yeah, like it just like literally it was like, you know, we were weeks away from just being like, hey, let's just go back to big company jobs and say we gave it a shot and we got, you know, kind of lucky, right time, right place. And we were the only game in town for credit card research for like 16, 18 months. And we just like kind of did really well and put away all that money to then build CBI. Nice. Okay. So it was a fortunate partnership that came. Fortunate partnership, you know, part of it just being like we just we really got lucky from a timing perspective, like mm -hmm. without going into all the, the economic issues, you know, there was like this mortgage crisis that happened. And then after right. that, you know, we built the product during that and everybody was like, hey, I'm still worried about the mortgages. I don't care about credit cards. And then once they felt good about that, for, you know, we credit cards happened to be the thing that every that these guys started worrying about. And like when they needed somebody in the space, like there wasn't anybody but us. So, um, so you know, part of it was this fortunate partnership with this person who was really very smart and who kind of like realized that we have something unique here. And part of it was just like us being right time, right place. Like, I, I, I wish I would like to claim it was just genius by our team, but it was it was literally like just us getting lucky. Awesome. All right. What's one piece of advice you'd give to your 25 year old self? The 25 year old self. Um, I think, I, you know, I was in a rush to be an entrepreneur for sure. And I ended up starting it much later. And I always felt like, you know, I started it sort of mid third, you know, probably early thirties. And, uh, you know, I was always like, oh man, I thought I'd start a company by the time I was 25. Um, in a lot of ways, like waiting was actually like worked out really well. Like we sell into like, you know, we're selling six figure deals now. And a lot of what I learned at American Express, which I always thought I'd leave in 18 months or two years has actually been super helpful. So, you know, I think like patience, um, you know, things work out the way they're supposed to work out, even if they don't go exactly to, to the plan that you, that you'd have hoped. Uh, you know, I think that was my biggest thing. Cause I was always like, Oh man, I'm behind schedule. I thought I'd be started. I've already started my company at this point. And, uh, uh, but I think like it, because I didn't, because I got sort of that training at Amex on how to sell into big companies. Um, it's actually been super valuable in building CV insights. Interesting. Okay. How do you structure your day? Oh, I'm terrible at this. Um, so I am trying to get better at this. So I'm just being very honest. I am, tr you know, right now it is uh, in the morning. It's uh, you know proposals out to clients and kind of response to prospective clients is where I try to spend most of my time. Um, just because that stuff's like got time sensitivity to it often. Um, you know, afternoons are, uh, I'm trying to spend a little bit more time thinking about sort of, you know, work, not, not just thinking, I'm not sitting like in my, at my desk, just like pontificating, but um, kind of sitting down with the team and trying to figure out, okay, like on the content side, like what types of experiments should we be running? What types of things do we see other people doing in other spaces that we think we could replicate, right? Um, uh, or thinking about with the product team, like what's the thing that, uh, you know, we should be developing, like what should be on the roadmap. So a little bit more strategic. Um, and then sort of the latter part of the day is more sort of transactional, like responding to people that have called or just emails that were less of a, less critical. Um, but you know, it's not extremely, uh, you know, it's probably like not the thing that I'm best at. I'm not that I, I don't have like a very regimented routine. Um, you know, we, because of how we built the business, it's, you know, we always are going to put away more money every month than we spend. So like, just as an example, this, we're at the end of the month, right? So this last week was just all about closing new business. Like that was it. Right. And so like yesterday we had a killer day, like, you know, like just, but it was, I want to close business at the end of the month. At the beginning of the month, I'm maybe thinking more strategically about other stuff. So it probably shifts a little bit because of just like sales cycles and, and where we are in the month, to be honest. Got it. Okay. I want to shift back one second. You talked about how Amex taught you how to close six figure deals. I mean, what can you share around that? Yeah. So I think the thing is that you have to realize, um, what motivates people, right. At a company, right. Cause 
you know, when we started, the, when we launched CBI, we were like, oh, we'll be the low cost solution in this space. And that's like the absolute stupidest thing you can do in our space because, you know, our customers don't care about low cost. They're not spending their money generally, right? They're spending their firm's money, right? And so what motivates most of our customers is they want to, you know, at a really simplistic level, they want to look good in front of their boss or they want to get out of work early or ideally both, right? And so you have to realize like what motivates folks. And so some people are maybe very motivated by they want they want to have some a solution that's going to like give them let them look really good when they're doing a presentation, right? So if that's the case, you want to highlight, like, we want to highlight on CB Insights all these crazy visualization features that we have, right? If somebody's, like, the data guy who really wants to get into the weeds on the data and, like, build a rigorous model about what's happening in an industry, like, then you want to emphasize that. So I think you want to, you know, and so the thing we try to do up front in sales or even our customer success team is, like, we ask, like, you know, at the end of this trial or at the end of this subscription, like, what's going to make it a no-brainer for you to subscribe or buy CB Insights? Um, and so, like, if we can, so that tells us a lot about what they care about. You know, sometimes they'll say, well, our company cares about this, but like, oftentimes they'll say, like, you know, hey, like, I spend a lot of time gathering financing data by reading 40 different blogs. So for that person, like, we're going to show them like how we're going to save them a ton of time while. Somebody else who's like, oh, I present at senior meetings and I'm at conferences all the time. I need, I need cool stuff that I can share. Like then we're going to show them a whole different set of capabilities. So that's the thing I think I learned at Amex was that like how everybody's got different motivations. It's not about revenue or cost or you know sometimes it's more yep. it's more ego driven things. Um, and so you got to find what those are and and like figure out how your solution. You got to get sort of in the skin of a customer and then figure, show them how your solution helps them solve that issue or solve that challenge or that need that they have. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, obviously there's, there's a lot of people, you, you know, you guys are, you guys are, you know, top in terms of uh, figuring out, uh, you know, how to visualize data and collecting data in general. So, you know, everybody's talking about looking for data scientists. That's kind of like the, the, you know, the hot role right now. So how do you go about finding great data scientists? Yeah, it's um, it's uh, you know, to some degree, we've been really we've been sort of lucky on the data science side because you know our newsletter is growing pretty quickly. We're probably growing it by about a thousand people a week, and um, uh, and so like we actually end up getting a lot of inbound, right? And so like somebody who's like, hey, I love like startups and like you know data and venture capital, right? Like we're sort of like the perfect home for that person, right? And then sometimes we'll like actually look on, we'll look at people's individual blogs, right? So we might see somebody who like tweets out about, you know, they did a project in a particular language that we think is interesting. And then we'll go look at their blog and we'll be like, oh, that person's like taken NBA statistics and done all these cool things with them, right? Like then it's like, all right, like somebody who's like innately sort of intellectually curious and who's like loves data right and, I, and like we deal with interesting data like we're not like doing like you know actuarial tables for like life insurance or something like and, and maybe that could I, I shouldn't say that like that might be very interesting <laughs> to some people right but like for us like startups emerging tech like what's next like I think it's amazing so you know we can like say hey listen you know we know you're really into data you've done all these cool things on like the NBA and college sports or whatever like you know, hey, like, you know, your skills are very transferable, you know, would you be interested? So I think like we've been, you know, some of it, I think because of the, a little bit because of the brand and the newsletter, we get some people just inbound to apply. And then we try to find people who might be like-minded and, and say, hey, listen, like you could do some really cool stuff here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it seems to, seems to be working, you know, I mean, we're, we're still trying to, recruiting is always difficult, especially now, but um but uh, I think we've been pretty fortunate there. Right. It's almost like when you evaluate a designer and you go to like a Dribbble or a Behance and you look for them, same thing with like a really yeah. good blog writer, right? Exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, if we can find, and, and, and you know, we'll reach out to people who just say like not interested, I'm really happy where I am, right? But like I think our philosophy here is like it's never a bad idea to meet smart people, right? So, um, you know, if they write blogs or if they're doing stuff in statistics or whatever that seems interesting and they're messing around with different visualization libraries, like, you know, it, it costs all of 
maybe 15 minutes to try to like send an email, uh, you know, at the, if that, uh, so, you know, why not do that? So yeah, we've been, we've been, uh, you know, yeah, I wish there was a dribble for data scientists. That would be cool. But, um, there's an idea for the audience. There we go. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, I think that would be, that would be pretty cool. Cool. All right. What's one must read book you'd recommend? Ooh, the psychology of persuasion. Is that the Robert Caldini book? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Got Amazing it. book, yeah. Perfect. Cool. So, you know, this has been great. Uh, and then what's the best way for people to find you online? Um, uh, so, at CB Insights uh, is what I will kind of mention first. Um, I'm at Ace Onwall, but I'm pretty bad at Twitter. So, I'd probably follow at CB Insights ahead of me because we're, really, we're much better at Twitter as a company. Uh, so yeah, that's the way to find us. And then our website is www.cbinsights.com. If you're interested in startups, VC, emerging tech, uh, sign up for a free trial. Uh, it's uh, you know, and then uh, you know, if you like what you see, uh, just reach out to me, and we'll set up a demo, and, and hopefully get you on board. All right, yeah, it's it's you know, CB Insights is definitely a treat for anybody, not just interested in VC, but uh, startups in general. I think a lot of interesting insights, obviously CB Insights. But um, and then thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Have a great day. Hey, everyone. Just a quick heads up that we're giving away a ebook called 29 Growth Hacking Quick Wins. We co authored this book with Matan Griffel of One Month, and it'll give you a solid base on where you can create growth ideas from. So all you need to do is text Quick Tips to 33444. That's the word Quick Q U I C K and Tips, T I P S is in sugar, to 33444, and you get instant access. Thanks for listening to this episode of Growth Everywhere. If you loved what you heard, be sure to head back to growtheverywhere.com for today's show notes and a ton of additional resources. But before you go, hit the subscribe button to avoid missing out on next week's value-packed interview. Enjoy the rest of your week and remember to take action and continue growing.